Education. America's school system has been stuck inside the same structure, but that world has begun to change. By embracing the best ideas from a myriad of disciplines, we are transforming the shape of education. Welcome to Mash Ed Up. Reimagine education. Well, hi folks, how's everybody? I know as a teacher, the after lunch slot can be a little dicey. I can always tell when my students are coming in after lunch, who's eaten lunch, who hasn't eaten lunch, what they've eaten for lunch. They could be very low, they could be very hyper, but um, one thing I have to say, it's really wonderful to be here, thank you. So what I wanted to talk about today was this amazing job that I've had for the last 14 years. I'm a teacher in the kitchen at the Edible Schoolyard program in Berkeley. And this program is um, a pretty wonderful collaboration between a local business, Chez Panisse, and a public school, Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School. And Alice Waters had the idea to have the kids cultivate a one-acre garden and then learn to cook the things that they've grown in the garden. And I'm the lucky soul that got the job of the cooking teacher. And I have to say, when I took the job, honestly, I thought, this is valuable. You know, kids need to learn how to cook. This is information that everybody needs to have. But I really didn't take it further than that. And then as I started working with the teachers in the school, and we started thinking about how can we connect their curriculum in the classrooms to what's happening in the, ki <clears throat> in the kitchen, I started to really think, you know, the kitchen is kind of the perfect classroom. And then it made me think about my years growing up at home, and I was very fortunate. I, I grew up in a big family, five kids, and two parents, usually a, a slew of people coming through for dinner every night. And dinners at our house were really riotous occasions. And I started thinking about how we were just sitting around the table for easily an hour every night and learning how to listen to each other how to debate, how to procrastinate, how to tell a story. And as an adult now, I really go back so often in my head to those evenings in the kitchen and all the things that we learned. And I'm finding that the same is true in my classroom at school. And it's just incredible. I think one of the things that makes the kitchen such a great classroom is that Ultimately, nobody is in control. We really all need to be working together. And there are times when I can step back and I see this kitchen teeming with 30 adolescents. My students are 11, 12, and 13 years old. They're all working away, they're all engaged, they're having conversation, and I honestly sometimes don't know, how is this all gonna come together? I mean, my school is, it's a, is an amazing school. There, it's a very diverse school. There are over 22 different languages spoken in our school. When the ELL class comes in, I can't even communicate with them unless I can make things into a story. That's what I have really learned as a teacher. If I can make them feel that what they're learning is relevant, if I can make it edible, and if I can tell a story, I've got them. And those years of sitting around the table with my five siblings and all of us wanting to talk, you gotta learn to get your chops down and tell a story. So for example, if I have a sixth grade class coming in and they're studying Egypt, we might be making something with fava beans. And I don't know how many people here, just curious, do, do you guys know about fava beans? Has anybody eaten them? Have you ever had them before? Oh, of course, this is the Bay Area. Well. If you've ever cooked them, you know that they're quite labor intensive. It takes a ton of work for kind of a small reward, which is why this is the perfect thing to do with 30 children, because they will go through a bushel of fava beans like that. So what I have found, though, is that if I can get them to stop and really observe what they're doing, I can add a little extra depth to this activity of just cooking. And one thing I did notice is that the fava bean leads a really cushy life. I mean, I don't know if you can see, but this is a padded pod here. The fava bean 
just gets to spend its days hanging out in this little beautiful hammock of softness. And it's a, a very contemplative kind of quiet lifestyle. I was actually going to share some of these with you guys because you should take it home and check it out. So you people on the pods here in the front, you're going to get some fava beans. Here you go. And you know, if I was better at sports, I might be able to throw to them a little further out. But I ended up in the kitchen because I wasn't good at sports. So what I do like to try to tell the kids, though, is hone your powers of observation. Don't just get to the end of every job, but really think about what are you doing each step of the way and notice it. What does it smell like? What does it feel like? What does it look like? What does it sound like? And then talk to each other about that. And I have to say, I've heard some pretty incredible conversations in the kitchen at Edible Schoolyard. I have heard two boys grating cheese and talking about grating for over five minutes. I didn't know there was that much to do with grating, personally. And these boys were just breaking it down. Well, you know, this side is kind of dangerous because it's very pointy. And they went on and on and on. And I just started thinking, the wonderful thing about the kitchen is that the quality of time that you spend there is really sort of magical. Because on the one hand, you're occupied in this endeavor of making a meal. And it sort of frees you up to talk. It's almost, I always think about when you're on a road trip in the car. And you ever think about the quality of the conversations that you have when you're on one of these long trips. And it's sort of due to the, the makeup of what you're doing. You're sitting in the car. You're not facing each other. You're looking out at something else. And something about the fact that you're not facing each other makes you really sort of open up and really dig deep and have these kind of conversations that you think about later. And I think the kitchen is the same way. Once you get your hands on a knife, and this is the goal of every middle schooler is to get the eight-inch chef knife, then you start to chop. You get into a little bit of a meditative state. And all of a sudden, the person next to you has something to say. And this may be somebody who, in the hallway, you would never even look at this person. You would never give them the time of day. But because you are next to each other, washing parsley, chopping parsley, it creates this little pod, this little space for you to connect and interact. And I have found that the connection is the metaphor that really connects everything that happens in the kitchen. When I talk to the teachers and they tell me what they're studying in the class, I have to be honest, sometimes I really think, you know, I'm kind of glad I'm not in that class because it just sounds like such a dry bone to me. To take a concept of, say, um, farming in China and relate that to developing the culture of the Chinese civilization. But kids really understand if you can make a small component grow. So for example, if I have a class of seventh graders who are studying China, and they've been reading their textbook, which is abysmal, if I have to be honest, uh, there's a big chapter about the development of the chain pump and the quick growing rice. Not very exciting, unless you start to think about it in the context of what did this do for people. The chain pump allowed for irrigation. The quick going rice meant that all of a sudden, there were two crops of rice every year instead of one. And what that meant was that people had a surplus. And I can talk to my students about the concept of surplus. As a matter of fact, we're going to be making some fried rice with them because you need leftover rice to make fried rice. You can't make fried rice with hot rice. It just turns into mush. So this is a concept I can say to my students. If you're a farmer, and all of the sudden, because of the technology of this chain pump, and because of the quick growing rice, you now have a surplus. You have a surplus of food, you have a surplus of money, and you have a surplus of time. What do you do with that? And I ask my students, what do you guys do with your free time and your free money? And they might say, well, I buy music off of iTunes, I read, and I draw. And another student might say, well, I skateboard, and I like to act, and I love animals. And I say, you know something? 
that is you. That's your personal culture of one. Now, if you expand this idea out to a nation, and what does a nation do with their free time? These are the things that define us as a culture. And it's a way for a student who basically is the center of their own universe, as I think most of us are, to really take the idea of how does a culture become created and have it make sense to them. And after they're sort of thinking about that, we start to break off into our groups. And the next thing you know, we're making fried rice. We've got our surplus of rice, and we've got this idea. And the idea has been planted in a real experience. The thing about learning, I feel, for kids is if you can connect a revelation, an idea, a practice, a thought to a real experience, it just takes root in you in a way that's just not the same when you're sitting at a desk in a hot classroom that's visually uninspiring, and the most interesting thing is the person next to you who's secretly texting under the desk. So my, sen my whole sense of teaching is that the kitchen is the place where it can all happen. Now, in, this, in the kitchen at Edible Schoolyard, it's a beautiful room. The kids come in, and I can watch them as they come in. Their body language changes. This feels like their space to them. And I started to think about it, and I thought, well, you've, it makes sense, you know? I mean, if you're giving a party, and you're really going to do it right, you clean your whole house. And if you're really fastidious, you might even sweep off your porch. You might rake your yard to no avail, because we all know, where does everybody end up? When you're having a party, they all end up crammed in the kitchen. That's where people want to be. And it's the same thing at school. Our kitchen is really the hub of the school. I have kids come in before school, bringing in eggs from the chickens. They know those chickens. They know their names. They write the date on the egg. They write the name of the chicken that laid it. They put it away. They are really responsible for a lot of the things that come from the garden into the kitchen. Another thing that they do, they like to come in and fold laundry. It's a very homey activity. We do a lot of laundry every day, and the kids like to come in after school and hang out, maybe make themselves a cup of tea or get a snack, and then they like to fold laundry. They'll come in and dry dishes. They'll come in and put away things that need to be put away. They'll take out the compost to the garden. Why do they do this? Because they love to be around grown-ups, and they love to be around grown-ups who are giving them attention, people who are caring about them. There's something about just the very act of standing next to somebody who's older than you, who is giving you their attention. And it makes you feel like you just want to open up a little bit more. We have, oh my god, I don't know how many volunteers who come in from the community, people who are really interesting. And they take a few hours out of their week, every week, to come in and work with the kids. And it's so moving to see how attached these kids get to these volunteers. And they might be it's because they have an interesting job. Maybe they're a pastry chef. Maybe they work in film. Maybe they're in books. But it sends a message to these kids that these grown-ups find them interesting. And when somebody finds you interesting, all of a sudden you just kind of become your best self. And that is a real message that happens daily in the kitchen at Edible Schoolyard. I have to say, it's a pretty magical place. And sometimes I stand back and I just think, I don't even know how this is all coming together. And it's because when the kids come in, they have an intention. They have a purpose. They know the drill. It's a really sort of strict structure. There's a clear beginning. They come in. They put their things away, they get on an apron, they wash their hands, we gather around the middle table. Then we have what we call the chef meeting. In the chef meeting, I'm talking about what we're going to be making for the day. And I'm trying to pull in any ideas from the curriculum that I can and sort of embed them into this whole process of what we're going to be doing. I'm also trying to make every single job in this recipe sound like this is what I want to do. Something like washing lettuce. Maybe not something that's everybody's favorite job, but if you say, you know, this job is for people who have excellent eyesight, who can spot any critters that are in this lettuce, 
It might be a good job for somebody who wants to catch up with your friend because it's a great two-person job. So I'm trying to get people to connect maybe to somebody that they normally wouldn't. I'm also trying to plant ideas for when they go back to the classroom and they're reading that textbook and they read a word that connects them back to the kitchen experience, they're more open to remembering it and to learning about it. For example, I have a class that's studying the Middle East. It's a pretty fascinating, let me move these guys. It's a really fascinating set of um, facts that come out when they're talking about certain populations, say, in the Arabian Peninsula. And one thing that I really latched onto was the date palm and how the date palm was so important to the Arabs. One, because around the oasises, they could grow it. They flourished. Actually, what surprised me, I, I found out as well, they grew peaches, too. Who knew? I kind of thought, what an amazing experience to be sitting in the middle of a desert and eating a perfectly ripe peach just warm off of the tree. Well, anyway, when we get to the dates, this is my best visual that I have, which is frightening as a teacher to hold this up in front of a class of 12-year-olds. It gets worse when you get to what we're actually going to be using. This is a dried date. I can teach you a quick recipe actually right now. Really great. You could go home and do this tonight. If you open this up and you remove the pit, which is right inside, take out the pit, and then you replace it with an almond. You seal it right back up again together. And then you put it in the oven and just heat it up for about maybe five or 10 minutes at 350. And that's it. You're done. Take it out. You will be amazed at what happens, what the transformation is with this. Of course, this may be what we're doing in the kitchen. But all the while, I'm telling my students, if you were a nomad and you lived in the desert, the date palm would be your best friend. From the date palm, you get wood to build your structures. You get shade. You get fronds that you can use as the roof of your house. You drink the sap. You eat the dates. And guess what you do with the pits? I love this. You feed them to your camels. They love them. I started thinking, how many pits does it take to get a camel to feel full? I don't even know. But this is the kind of thing that can happen in the kitchen. And that's the difference between reading in a textbook that date palms flourished in the oasises. And if you're in the kitchen, and we're talking about this, and we're just about to start eating it, the last thing I say is, where do you think you have to go to get a date palm around here? And of course, it sounds like the most exotic thing in the world, when in actual fact, I paste it out. If I went 126 steps from the kitchen, there's a date palm right there on Grant Avenue in Berkeley, California. Amazing. Now, what I also wanted to tell you was, when I'm finding the story in something, Sometimes I surprise myself. I had a group of sixth graders. We were actually making a fruit salad. And I was teaching them how to peel a citrus with a knife. Really simple. I'm going to show you right now. So what you want to do is you want to find the stem end and the blossom end. And I'm just going to trim those off like this. I also tell the kids. This is a great thing to snack on, so don't put this in the compost until you've eaten all the little bits out of it. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take your knife and you're going to take the peel off. And remember, this is not a square, so you're not going to cut straight down. You're going to follow the shape of the fruit. You're going to start to smell something incredible as you open up and reveal this beautiful, glistening, gorgeous grapefruit. Now, as I start to take this off, we're going to end up with what we call the bald grapefruit. And what you do then is you start to notice around the sides the little edges where the membranes are. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to start to take my knife and cut down in between each segment. When you do this, that whole process is called supreming a grapefruit. 
kind of a fancy pantsy word, I have to say. It's not my favorite, but it does make me think that every time a, a Supreme song comes on the radio, it gives me another connotation. And any time I can have a food connotation with something, it always makes me feel at home. So, so I'm showing my students how to do this. We start to get down to what's left when you end up taking out this fruit. And after you've segmented it all apart, what you're left with is this little inside piece of all these membranes that are just connected together by the center. It's the story of the grapefruit right here. I'm going to read it to you right now. Hello, I'm a grapefruit. I started my life as a flower. As I grew, I realized I spent my days hanging out in the sun, bobbing on the branches, surrounded by my family and friends. What a fantastic life. One day, something changed. All of a sudden, a ladder was pushed up against the side of the tree. Somebody picked me and put me in a box. And there I sat on the ground, surrounded by other members of my family in the box. A dog came walking by, and I got a little nervous, but it just sniffed and moved on. Through a series of events that I couldn't really explain, I ended up at the Oakland Farmer's Market on a Friday morning. And Ms. Cook was coming along, and she was feeling all the grapefruits and picking them up one by one. What was she feeling for? She was feeling for who was heaviest, because the one who's heaviest is the juiciest. And guess what? She picked me. I ended up here with you all. And I actually came to find that my life as a grapefruit is over today. And strangely, I don't mind. As a matter of fact, it's been really lovely meeting you all. Thank you. The end. <laughs>